All right. Now, we're in John chapter 5, and Jesus has just healed a fellow by this pool of Bethesda. And you can see I'm picking it up around here, around verse 9, 10 or so. And there's a multitude of sick people lying around this pool waiting for it to bubble because what they understood was that if you got into that pool while it was bubbling, the first one, that one would get well. And so there's a lot of people going to this place, kind of like what they do in, in France at Lourdes, and uh, they want to get healed. And Jesus comes into this place to a man who's been sick for 38 years. And he knew he was sick for a long time. And he says, would you like to get well? And the fellow says, well, I, I don't have anybody to put me in the water. Somebody gets there ahead of me. And he says, pick up your bed, your pallet, and walk. And the guy gets up. So I would think this guy is pretty happy. After 38 years. 38 years. And he's walking around. Now, here we have a problem. Because it's the Sabbath. And Jesus did this deliberately on the Sabbath. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it is the Sabbath and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. The reason for that is in the Ten Commandments, it says, keep the Sabbath Holy. It was a day of rest. It was something built into the fabric of creation. God specifically took the seventh day, made it holy, and he rested from his work. Not because he was tired, but because everything was done. Complete. Full. And there was nothing to be added. There was nothing left over incomplete. He's not like the builder that says on Friday, well, I got almost everything done, but I'll come back on Monday and pick up that little bit that I didn't get done. Because <laughs> God is not a cowboy. When he looked over all of creation, he said, it is very good. Now that turns out to be Adam's first full day of existence. So his very first full day of existence is a day of rest. It's a day of holiness. And it is absolutely complete and full in every way. And God says, this is the way things are. And I don't want you to ever work on the seventh day. I want you to keep it holy and set it aside. It's a time to be holy to the Lord. You're not to do any work. And that's what it also says in Exodus chapter 20, when Moses reiterated the law on the Sabbath, he says, six days you shall work. The seventh is a day of rest, Sabbath, and you're not to do any work. Your animals aren't to do any work. Your sons aren't to, supposed to work. No servants work. Nobody works. Now, by the time we're reading about this, these Jews, and especially the Pharisees, they're the dominant school of interpretation of the Bible for the previous hundred years, they've developed what is called a hedge around the law. 
and that is to prevent you from even getting close to violating that law. And what they did was develop reasonings, understandings, what constitutes a burden. And they, they came to what some people feel are absurd lengths. And it is absurd. So if you accidentally got a piece of straw on your robe, was that carrying a burden on the Sabbath? And they spent a lot of time debating this stuff. Well, what we want to notice here is this man is definitely violating the hedge around the Sabbath. And he's coming into direct conflict with these Jewish leaders. So they stop this guy. And as we noted last week, he's busted. Mm -hmm. It is the Sabbath, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. Mm -hmm. So what do you think you're doing? This is kind of like getting stopped for a speeding ticket. <laughs> And it's, it's awkward. But he's got a good answer. He who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. I think that's a brilliant piece of argument. Because he made me well. Here's a guy who's been sick for 38 years, on this day, he's walking around and probably has not been able to walk for 38 years. And he says, the guy who healed me told me to do this. I figured he had the authority. Right. And he does. Because <laughs> the one who healed him is God. You also think the greatest burden was being the way he was for 38 years. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to debate if that counts as work. Mm -hmm. But I, I will give good. you this. He was free right now. Yep. He was moving. He was going places. So he refers it back to Jesus. And they said, well, who is that guy who said you pick up your pellet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place, which is also interesting. Because if I'd have healed the guy, I would have stuck around for the guy to say, oh, you're the best guy in the world. This is amazing. And I would say, ah, shucks. Ah, oh, you, don't, you don't have to do that. You, you don't have to do that. But I mean, Jesus slipped away and the guy goes, where'd he go? Mm -hmm. And probably somebody else was saying, where did who go? Jesus just faded away. Which kind of takes us back to that point that not everybody was healed every time. Not everybody was healed <laughs> because every time. He wasn't there going from person to person to person to person. Yeah. He just go. knew this man approach this man. And just to fill in that a little bit, we want them to note that there are some people who teach things that aren't biblical about healing, such as, and this was the point, God heals everybody every time. And the thing about teaching is if, if that is so, then you should be able to see that confirmed in the Bible. And I said last week, all you have to do is find one instance where Jesus does not heal everybody, and then you know, well, then that's not true. And this is actually the first thing that ever popped into my mind concerning that is, 
Jesus goes into a place where there's a multitude of people who are sick, and he only heals one guy. So that's why you got to read your Bible. Because the more Bible you're familiar with, then when somebody says something that's not biblical and therefore not true, you'll think, wait a minute, it says this here, and it doesn't line up with what that person says. And even though that person represents themselves as a really big Bible teacher and he's wearing a suit and a tie. And usually that solves all the questions right there. But it's really got to line up with the Bible. And so we noticed that he only healed one guy. And he says, who is this guy? And he didn't even know who it was. Jesus deliberately slipped away. Now in verse 14, it says, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, behold, you've become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. That's an interesting comment too. It's quite a statement. Yes, what? It's quite a statement. Yeah. It is quite a statement. Do you know, he's telling him, don't sin anymore. There's a possibility that how this guy got sick is through some kind of sin. Now, what Jesus is not saying here is that if you sin, you will get sick. Like, it's some kind of curse that comes and gets you. And some people use that to say, well, you know, if you're sick, it's your fault. And that's not always the case sometimes. Job. Job. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. And the blind man of the pool of Salaam. Okay. So there are instances where things happen to people we would say this is not good, and it wasn't because of sin. There's there's two examples right there in the Bible. So what Jesus is not saying is that if you sin, you will get sick. And if you're sick, well, it's because you sinned. That doesn't follow. But you know what he is saying? And this is, this is a principle in the Bible. It says in Isaiah, and it's quoted again in Hebrews chapter 12. And it says, make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint. Shall we find that one so that you know I'm telling you the truth? That's in Hebrews chapter 12. Okay, it's right here. It says, therefore strengthen the hands that are weak, the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. And here's the point. When you use your joints in a wrong way, you can injure them. And I found this out when I, I used to read my Bible in bed, propped up on my elbows. And I found I was getting tennis elbows in both elbows. And it kind of dawned on me, maybe I shouldn't read in bed propped up on my elbows. And when I stopped doing that, why my elbows went back to normal. And I learned something there. If you're doing something with your joints that stresses them and you're using them in a way that they're not meant to be used, why you could hurt them, and if you keep on doing that, you could really mess yourself up. Now, the analogy here is, don't use your limbs for things that are sinful, but rather walk in a straight path. Do the things that God says, 
There's a, a scripture that's in the Proverbs. It says, fear God and turn away from evil. It will be refreshment to your body and healing to your bones. It is a healthy thing to walk in God's ways. That's what he's talking about here. And that's what I believe Jesus is talking about here. Walk with God. And, you know, this is a negative way of putting things, don't you think? Don't sin anymore. That's not exactly what a Christian life is about. Is to just walk carefully and, oh, I'm not going to sin there. Oh, I'm not going to sin there. It's not about the don'ts. As much as the do's. There are so many good things to be doing. This is part of the thing about make straight paths. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth. See? And in Psalm 23, it says, He makes me walk in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So, following Jesus... Seeking God, it's more than just, I don't do this, I don't drink, I don't chew, and I don't go with the girls that do. Nah. There's lots more. There's knowing God. And this is, this is what I do. It's not so much of what I don't do. It is this life of seeking God and knowing him. Not just knowing him in my head, but having him write his word on my heart. That's what happens when you meditate in the word of God day and night. Meditation belongs to God. He invented it. And what it's for is to fill your mind with his word, which is true, lovely, beautiful. As I was praying, the unfolding of his word gives light. And we don't have to grope in darkness like many people in the world do because they don't know which way to go. They don't know which end is up. And God could possibly not be that. Anything but that. Well, they're going to keep groping. But the one who seeks the Lord and learns his word is going to know God. And that is eternal life. That's what Jesus says in John chapter 17. To know you, the one true living God, that is eternal life. So, yeah, he says, don't sin anymore. And the positive way to express that is know the Lord. You don't want something worse to happen. You want that life of God in you. So that just like the person who meditates in the word of God day and night, Psalm 1, He's going to be like a tree planted by rivers of water that bears its fruit in season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. So that's Psalm 1. And that's so important to our lives. Well, okay, Jesus found him. How do you find something? Yeah. You look for it. So I got to put that in red. It's only a matter of time until I switch to red. Mm -hmm. and Jesus he went to the temple. He went to the temple. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. To thank God? I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
That's really important. Mm -hmm. That is, when God does something good for you, you acknowledge it. That's something we do every Sunday. It's a it's something I used to do with my family. I wanted to teach my daughters how to be aware of God and give God thanks. I would say, what did God do right today? And they would go, oh, bad. <laughs> everything. God did everything right. They go, that's the weasel answer. Can we be more specific? And we would talk about the good things that God helped us with and realize, wow, we had a good day. And see, that's what this fellow's doing. He's in the temple giving thanks. And Jesus is looking for him. So there they are in the temple. And I think it's interesting. How would you how would you characterize this sentence? Well, I was thinking about like don't go on sinning. All right. Because it is an active um verb right. form. So he's saying don't go on sinning. And as long as we go on sinning, we are in a state of resisting God. All right. We're resisting his will, his authority over our lives. We're we're resisting surrendering to his will. <laughs> All right. So don't go on resisting God. All right. Yeah. Now look, I looked up the verb here in, in, in Greek, the original language, and look what it says. It's an imperative. Mm -hmm. So that says Jesus is commanding you. Um, That's a command. Also, it's now, an attribute is, of God, isn't it? What? It's an attribute of God that he can say... Don't sin because right. he's perfect. He's the perfect judge. Well, he is the boss. How about that? You know, if we're right relationship with God, that means he can tell us what he wants. And we say that is good, acceptable, and perfect. Mm -hmm. But it's also, it's a present active imperative. So it is that go on, don't go on sinning. Yeah. Break the cycle. Jesus also knows yeah. that since the fall, we have this battle within us between what we want to do and what we should, should we know what we should yeah. do. Okay. Who just will we listen out. to? Yeah, he's just going to get out this. Yeah. So look at this. I want to just show you a couple of things here. Let's go to verse 11. Then. I'm in Romans now, chapter 6. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of the do's that I was talking about. He says, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Mm. And it's this identification with Jesus in his death and in his resurrection. That's the meaning of baptism. They put you in the water, and that symbolizes that Jesus' death is my death. When he was buried, I was buried. They bring you out of the water because they don't let you drown. And coming out of the water is saying, when Jesus rose from the dead, I rose with him. All right? So it says, that's something you're supposed to do. You're in Christ Jesus. His death is yours. His life is yours. So then he says, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. So sin is no longer reigning. It's no longer the boss. Mm -hmm. Don't go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So that's that's what this fellow is doing. He's presenting himself to God there in the temple. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're supposed to do. And the very first thing we're supposed to do is say, hey, here I am. I'm alive from the dead. Wow. Mm -hmm. 
Well, if you think about 38 years and being in that condition, Jesus did literally just give him his life back. <laughs> you know, he was... That's pretty crazy. You know, well out of commission. He couldn't even get himself to the pool. Yeah. So... He got himself to the temple. It's, it's like a mm -hmm. resurrection, man. Which is up a hill from the pool. Yeah. yeah. All right. It's really... So here's the very first thing you can do in the morning. You wake up. And you say, hey, I'm presenting myself to you, God, as alive from the dead. Now, you may not feel like that. <laughs> there are days, I got to confess, when I do not feel like that. I feel a little bit more like Keith Richards. You ever seen Keith Richards? He's the uh, guitarist for the Rolling Stones. <laughs> My brother once said of Keith Richards, he looks like death warmed over. Oh, God. <laughs> and sometimes I feel a little bit like Keith, kind of death warmed over, but I can still say, hey, I present myself to you as someone alive from the dead mm -hmm. because I'm in Christ. See, it's not what I feel mm -hmm. and it's not what somebody says, it's what God says. That's what makes it legitimate for me to say that. I'm just agreeing with him. Taking him at his word. Taking him at his word. That's what he says. Yeah. So I'm just doing that. And here are all my members. Here's my eyes, my arms, my legs, everything I own, everything I am. They're for you. And he says, for sin shall not be master over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. And see, what that means is when you're under law, you're by yourself. You're on your own. Your mother would want to obey the law for you. I'll do it for you, Robbie. But the judge says, no, Mrs. Stingman, he has to obey the law himself. And not even God can help you when you're under law. But when you're under grace, that means God is helping you. God is enabling you. When God says, you're dead to sin, it is true. And when God says to you, you are alive from the dead, that is true. And God enables. That's so, the difference between law and grace. Yes, God sir. only gave the Ten Commandments when we were under sin. Well. Because Adam and, um, and Eve sinned. Many thousands of years later, he gave the Ten Commandments to the all right. Children of Israel. So men were already under sin when they got the law. True. So therefore, sin, being in a sin state, puts you under the law. But being out of sin takes you out of the law. That's what I'm saying. You see, Paul says, and that's an interesting point, that even before the law, sin was in the world. Yeah. And that's why people die. So the law doesn't put you there what the law is for is we're getting deep into it tonight actually is there not a law that law. god made when he said when he cursed the ground and everything that was he made a law that wages of sin is death in, in fact no nah, there's no law till moses this is just what the bible says but what the law is there for is to show what is sin mm -hmm. That's the purpose of it law. It is the measuring stick, yes. It's a mirror. And so you can definitely know that you're a sinner because you try to obey the law. You say, oh, I'm going to do it this time. And what you find out is you don't want to. And that, I don't want to, that sin mm -hmm. right there. Enemy of God. Yeah. Yeah. That's what sin is. That I good. want to do what I want to do. I do not want to do what God wants me to do. Or anybody else for that matter. Rebellion. All right. Now, we're kind of far afield here. Mm. But I just wanted to point out, these are good. the do's. Mm. And they're fabulous things to do. Much more fun than, shall we say, I can't sin. All right. This is not the first time he's told somebody don't go and sin. 
Girls. Or go to no, no more. Because mm. the lady that was caught in adultery did the same thing. Yeah, that's in chapter eight. Eight, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's okay, we'll get there. I'm just saying it's... I would say... Oh, it's also he's healing the Sabbath. He's done more multiple times. Yeah, healing the Sabbath, yeah. Yeah, he's healing the Sabbath a bunch of times. Mm. So mm. he's commanding this fella. Jesus gets to command us. If he's going to save us, we want to obey. Now this guy does something interesting. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, we got to think about this fella here. Look what he does. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. He felt the need to report back. Pardon me? He felt the need to report back. Evidently. Or maybe it was witness. Hmm. Well, they did ask him. They did ask him. They didn't know. So he went and told them. Hmm. Now it got Jesus in trouble. But it's That's not the guy's fault. Intention, right. You know what? He's just telling him it's Jesus. Hmm. Jesus is the one who healed me. So you can't be afraid of telling somebody about Jesus. There's always going to be somebody who doesn't like that. That's not what they want to hear. And, you know, you can't worry about stuff like that. There are people who just don't like Jesus. And... I remember a time in my life. I wasn't super crazy about Jesus either. So look at me now. I'm one of them. <laughs> How does that happen? How do you go from being somebody who doesn't want to become a Christian to actually being a missionary and a pastor? And the answer is it's a miracle. Mm -hmm. And God does stuff. And this is a miracle. And I think the guy wants to make sure. You want to know the guy that healed me? It was Jesus. What I think is even more kind of pronounced is just the fact that Jesus singled him out, mm -hmm. disappeared in the crowd. He knew this was coming. Oh, yeah. It was it was Sabbath, so, but it didn't keep him from doing it. All right. He, I mean, he was fully prepared for the cost. To see this man but also liberated from sin and sickness. It can't possibly be sin to heal the Sabbath because if it was, God wouldn't do it because he's perfect. There you go. Well, hey, is Jesus Lord of the Sabbath or what? He is. And he said he's Lord of the Sabbath exactly. And he's, yeah. he pointed out that he can okay. do whatever. <laughs> so who is the man? It's a witness to that guy because he was willing to do that, quote unquote, on the Sabbath when maybe he, quote unquote, shouldn't have, you know? Yeah. So what's getting shaken down here is our, our definition of what work is. It's mm -hmm. coming back to he was just carrying his pallet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if I'm obeying God by carrying my pallet, it's not I'm, there's no sin. <laughs> there's no sin. <laughs> on the Sabbath. So doing um, a good directs. On the Sabbath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we can put this up here. There's no sin going on here. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus healed them and told them. And that, you know, anything that Jesus tells you to do is right. Mm -hmm. And that's another reason to read the Bible. He's not telling you to sin. He won't tell you to sin. Yeah. And in fact, the Bible has the power to make you stop sinning. Mm -hmm. If you put the Bible into your heart, 
It will change you. And just like Romans 6 says, if you memorize that and meditate on it, you will find that you do not sin. Now, did you notice that the man went away? Where did he go? Away from Jesus. Away from Jesus. Away from that conversation. And where to? To look for the Jews. To look for the Jews. Now look. The ones that had asked him. Jesus looked for him. Mm -hmm. What did he do? He looked for them. He looked for the Jews. Yeah. He's doing the same thing that Jesus did. And he told them. So I kind of think that the, the man here is witnessing. He's not doing this to rap on Jesus. No. And just say, don't hurt me, don't hurt me. It was him, it was him, it was him. I, 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 I didn't do this. I don't even think he would, he probably thought he didn't even know that that would have been the results. Mm. He would probably be hoping that they would all go, oh, well, that's amazing. You want no, to just, yeah. yeah. The guy that healed you, let's so, talk yeah. to them. What do you think? <laughs> What do you mean you're mad at the guy who did this amazing thing for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that would be a little bit wrong, wouldn't it? No. To rat on the guy who just healed you after 38 years of being sick. It would be easy for him to assume that they would be just as enthusiastic as he was. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but, and yet. And then Ross, he probably made the <gasps> Yeah. All right. They did not rejoice. I think that needs to be said. Yeah. But it also shows that their worship is dead, that Jesus said what he said to them is true, that there are whitewashed tombs. Mm. Well, this is the attitude. This is what's going on here. Check this out. They're not rejoicing that a man was healed. And, you know, this was a miracle, right? Mm -hmm. They'd be super excited. God is showing up. You know, there are people who say that we've got to do miracles because then people will believe. Well, no, they didn't. They didn't. Yeah. Okay. Now, see, this stuff is written in the Bible, and you can listen to that kind of teaching and say, well, is it true? Yeah. And people say, unless we do signs and wonders, nobody's going to believe us. Jesus had to do that. But see, here's Jesus healing people. And there are people that do not believe, even though this guy is saying, hey, 38 years. But, you know, they're, they're kind of focusing on this He's breaking the Sabbath. He's breaking the Sabbath. And don't, don't, don't you think Jesus would have expected that, though, that uh, Jews would have been upset? Because it was passed down through Moses that thou should not work on the Sabbath. So he, he, he would have known that. It's true. Yeah. He did know that. You know, he did that deliberately. He didn't find out, oh, you're kidding. You mean I can't heal on the Sabbath? Oops. Except he also knew from another passage, we know he knew there was a double standard. Yes. Because, well, which of you has an animal that falls into a ditch, won't mm -hmm. pull him out on the Sabbath? Yeah. So this man is healed, and so he's carrying his mat. And it's that it's kind of that double standard that All right. Jesus reveals. So is this a question of authority? It is. Or was he test testing them? He was testing them, was he? Well, he certainly is provoking something here mm. deliberately. Yeah, again, it comes back to that definition of what's work and who gets to say what work is and what work should be done. Who's the boss? Yeah. Who's so, the authority? Thanks, you said come. But he answered them, my father is working until now and I myself am working. And these guys do not miss what Jesus is telling them. You know, I've even heard people say things like, did Jesus really didn't start thinking of himself as God until much later? 
<laughs> what does that even mean? Like he didn't know. Yeah, <laughs> They're just not paying attention. I don't know. I think reading the Bible <laughs> sheds such light on all kind of teaching. At the age of twelve, he said he was in his father's house. Yeah. Well, look. <laughs> They understood clearly that he is calling God his own father. And you know, this is really something unique about Jesus and no other, that he generally always refers to God as father. And it's his own father. And that is interesting because you got a guy like Pablo Picasso, the modern artist, who made about 45,000 works of art during his lifetime. And if you take one of his canvases, you have to look on the back and you'll find a Roman numeral. And the Roman numeral, besides the date, the numeral tells you which one it was that day that he painted. Because he'd just whip them off. When he was on a creative streak, he'd just be going through canvases like crazy. He had a guy making him canvases. That was his job. And so he'd just grab a canvas, do it, grab another one. And if you've ever seen a Picasso, you know that's the sound effect. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we call quantity, uh, quantity no quality. Well, you know what? Picassos are cool. Yeah. I saw the Picasso exhibit at the Modern Art Museum in New York in 1980. <laughs> and it was pretty darn cool. But enough of that. He had 45,000 works, but he only had one daughter. And there's a big difference between all that artwork and one daughter. Do you get that? Created being now, God created everything. But he has one son. And there's nobody like him. Now, this son makes himself equal with God. Mm -hmm. Equal with God. This is really Christianity right here is the Trinity. This is why Christianity is true. And by extension, you know, it comes out of Judaism. But the reason why this is true is because this is the revelation of the nature of God. Father, who has a son, whom he loves with a spirit. That means relationship is eternal. That's why love is the most important thing, because that's who God is. And for all eternity, the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father. They share the spirit of holiness in love. That's why the most important thing in life is relationships. Not stuff. Well, Jesus was not in doubt as to who he is. And in Philippians chapter 2, it talks about how Jesus existed in the form of God, the essence of God, and how he emptied himself, became a human being, he took on the form, the essence of a bond servant, became a human being while remaining God. 
being found in an appearance as a man, he be humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So here he is a human being, but he is equal with God. He is eternal, uncreated. Well, and see, they're there. They want to kill him because this is blasphemy. That's only blasphemy if he's wrong. If, if he's not God. But it's not blasphemy if he is really speaking the truth. So that's why Paul, in the first chapter of Romans, he says, the son of David, according to the flesh, declared with power to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Hmm. And that's what separates Jesus from everybody. Is that he died for our sins and he rose from the dead. This is according to the scriptures. which means you can find all this in the Old Testament. It's all there. And that's what the early church used to show and prove that Jesus is God, the Son of God, and that he is the Messiah. So, you know, Jesus is really coming out with the truth. This isn't blasphemy, and this isn't breaking the Sabbath. Because God's working. Mm. So am I. That's amazing. It is. So we're both working, he says. Mm. So now we're heading into some really amazing territory here. Verse 19 says, Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son, and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. So this is really interesting. The Son does nothing of himself. He doesn't act independently of the Father. And we say, as one? Yeah, as he later says. Unless it's something he sees the Father doing. So he says, I'm doing what the Father's doing. He's telling me to do this, I do it. I do it just like he says. He loves me. I think that's fabulous that that's uppermost in Jesus's mind. Mm -hmm. He loves me. And again, this is something he wants us to know the Father's love. And again, not as an intellectual exercise. But this is something that the Apostle Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 3. He talks about Christ dwelling in your hearts through faith and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, height, and depth and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. 
that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now, it's possible to experience something that goes past your knowledge. You don't understand it, but you can still experience it. And this is what Paul says is something that we can experience. I think this is one of the most amazing do's. Why fiddle diddle around with something trivial and insignificant when you can know that eternal love of Christ? That love that you may be filled up. Imagine the satisfaction when everything else in the world exhausts you turns you into a used toothpaste tube. <laughs> but this won't do that. This fills you up to all the fullness of God. That's amazing, isn't it? I'm going to go to one more spot in Romans chapter 5. Look what he says here. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Again, the love of God has been poured out within our hearts. Through the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we are developing this relationship with God so that we can know him. All right. The father loves the son, shows him all things that he's doing, all things. So imagine the, the knowledge of God, everything that God is doing. Just this morning, I was meditating about what God does in heaven, on the earth, in the seas, and in the depths. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go to the Mariana Trench, it's almost seven miles deep. It's the lowest place on the planet that we can get to. God is doing something that far down. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that scientists say that the moon has been explored more than the oceans. It's amazing. But the Bible says that God is doing things in the depths where we can't go. Mm. Well, he's showing them all things that he is doing, and he will show greater works than these. And I think he's talking about healing the guy. That's handwriting by the way, and it means healing the 38-year-old sick guy <laughs> because he says, just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son also gives life to whom he wishes. Now, I could say that too, <laughs> but I can't do it. It's one thing to be able to say it. It's another to be able to do it. And Jesus is saying, I can give life to whomever I wish. So, you know, you've heard of C.S. Lewis, who says, the guy who says stuff like this is either crazy or he is the devil from hell and he's lying or else he really is who he says he is. And those are the only choices. Either he's completely crazy and you need to ignore him or else he's lying. I read another C.S. Lewis quote. He says, either Christianity is false and we need to ignore it, or it's true 
And that means it is absolutely important, but one thing that it cannot be is moderately important. <laughs> true, that's true. Is that not amazing? Mm -hmm. It's either everything that you devote your life to or completely flush it down the toilet because it's a lie, but it's not kind of important. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus says, I give life to whomever I wish. That makes me want to look up that word. Wish? Well, that's what it says. To whom he wishes. Mm -hmm. Right. Ooh, and that's a word that can mean to wish or to will. Mm -hmm. With Jesus, it's not kind of like, I wish, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. He's saying, if I choose to do it, I will do it. So the Taoist is intended. Say what? I, and they, they also said intended, desired. desired. All right. Um, All right. That's how it's been translated in this particular translation. That is correct. So you were looking at the, def, the dictionary the definition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The further down desire, intended. Yeah. And this is the New American Standard translation, and this is all the different ways that this particular word has been translated, depending on uh, the declension of the noun. Did I say that? Yes, or the verb. It, whatever tense it is and however it's used in context, that's how they've chosen to uh, translate it in this particular translation. So if you look at those, it's it's interesting. It's like the way he wants to do it and uh, the way he delights to do it, desires. I mean, all that's part of it. In Psalm 135, it says that God does whatever he pleases. And this is what I was kind of marveling at. He's doing what he pleases in the Mariana Trench. Seven miles down, he's doing what he wants to do. I was just hearkening back in my brain to the um, first chapter where it says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those believed in, who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so this is his desires we're talking about. Okay. So he's saying, I'm working just like the father. Either he is who he is, or he's really lying, or he's crazy. But he can't be all of them. So this is where we, we, we listen to him, we look at his word, we look at the rest of the Bible, and we say, he's saying huge things. But we believe him. You know, all of it hangs on the resurrection. That's what proclaims him, declares him with power to be the son of God. And that establishes everything. So we're going to leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And everybody can continue reading chapter five of John. And we'll pick it up next week. Any questions? One, two, three, we're done. Shall we pray? Thank you so much, Heavenly Father, that you love the Son. Thank you that we get to know your love. Not just a, a theological proposition, but the experience of you loving us 
as a father loves his children. We get to know your everlasting love. We're so glad for that. And even now, we want to open up our hearts. We want to trust in Jesus that he is who he said he is. The son of God, the redeemer of the world, the one who died for our sins and rose again from the dead. We're so glad that we get to know Jesus, and when we get to know Jesus, we know you. We're so glad for that. We pray that you would be with us now. Bless our week. Be with us with all the things that we expect and in all the unexpected things. And you look out for us. We thank you that you're our shepherd. And you're going to be with us and lead us and guide us. We trust in you to do that. We commit ourselves into your hand and we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you.